Hey guys, welcome to the PCHD EMS podcast. My name is Jeff. I'm here with Wheeler and Lane, a couple of our critical care paramedics. We're going to be doing our airway class, the airway class that Lane and Wheeler uh, put on for our paramedics here at PCHD EMS in podcast form. So we're going to be basically going over everything that we do, uh, sequence intubation, uh, Wheeler likes to call it RSI, uh, but our medical director does not. So um, we're going to be going over, they're going to be going over the airway class that they do and um, you guys will be able to see the slides if you're watching on YouTube, and I'll put the slide show in the notes. Okay, so I guess we're going to jump right into it. Um, so we start our class out with the objectives, and I think this is a big change from when Lane made the slideshow or the presentation last time, is we don't really get into the seven Ps, uh, but he was really doing a lot of this based off the mindset and then the strategies. Um, so just jumping into it, uh, managing the chaos, pulling the trigger, airway strategies, patient optimization, the process, which is kind of like the seven Ps that we touch on a little bit, um, ventilatory strategies, and then special considerations. Okay. All right, so we use the heaven criteria now, and uh, it's basically a, a new and improved lemons criteria. So it's a, made by air methods um, to predictor of difficult uh, innovations, possibly difficult innovations. So for every criteria that they add on to a patient, it just increases the odds of it being difficult. Um, but what we try to preach to people is just that we can combat each one of these, and that's kind of how our whole process is geared towards is thinking that every patient has every single one of these and just how do we how do we fix each one of them so yeah. preparing for the the most yeah, possible so difficulty worst. yeah right. worst case scenario so and and we've seen um we've already seen improvements in our airway numbers from the last what i guess over the last three or four years yeah well, I was going to correct you earlier because you said this wasn't the best EMS oh, okay. slideshow, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, you know, organizations, 94% on first pass success rates, and I think we owe that to the process. Yeah. So, uh, Wheeler, one of the things you guys talk about in your in your class that I think makes it better than just a, a lecture or a CE is controlling your own emotions, your own, your own anxiety uh, that you bring into the call. Um, I know I still, I've been, a, I've been a paramedic for 10 years, I guess. Yeah. And I still deal with that every time I RSI somebody. Um, so. Yeah, so we put this into our slideshow um, because honestly, you know, how Lane was going over the heaven criteria, I think uh, what makes airways more difficult than seeing those factors is what we actually bring to the table. Uh, and if you've ever heard of George Kovacs, he's, you know, right up there, Scott Weingart, he's one of the airway godfathers, and he great, gives a great lecture uh, on YouTube, and I believe it was like a smack conference, and he goes into human factors, and this is a direct quote from him, is how to avoid shitting yourself when faced with a difficult, difficult airway. Um, and that really speaks true, um, because we're all, every airway is difficult, but if you can't calm yourself down or calm your crew down, the situation gets way worse. Yeah, you might not even be able to find the Lorenzo's go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so he also goes into how to combat the stressors of innovation or airway management. And one is, you know, how to calm down uh, performance anxiety, the lack of deliberate practice, right? Basically mindless practice. And what we tell our guys is if you're going into the training room and the mannequin's laying flat and you're innovating the mannequin and then you're just walking away, you're setting yourself up for failure, right? You need to use a holistic approach like um, setting the mannequin up on the stretcher at a 90 degree angle, putting a nasal cannula on, a non-rebreather or whatever device you're gonna use for pre-oxygenation, getting all your equipment out. So the more times you do that, you're gonna build muscle memory and so you're able to adjust to difficult situations a lot faster than you would if you hadn't practiced, right? So I shouldn't be practicing by just putting the tube in and then not even inflating the cuff and just doing it again over and over again. Correct. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Right, because that's not how you do it in the real world, right? You don't just innovate a patient and walk away. So you gotta have a holistic process. In the real world, I have forgotten to inflate the balloon, probably because I've right. practiced just putting the tube in and then walking away from the patient. So. Right, and so, we're real big here with everybody, you know, coming up with your own way to do things, right? We all, we're all different. Just making sure that you have muscle memory or you've built muscle memory in your practice of knowing where all your equipment's out because that's something you can control. You can't control what kind of call you go on and what kind of disease process and the uh, type of airway you're going to come in contact with, but you can control how you set up. 
Um, so that kind of takes the, the anxiety out of it. Um, and then the lack of team effort and uh, communication. So as far as that's concerned in airway management, um, it does lane no good. And I always like to use exam- is, this as an example. Me and Lane are running a bad call and we're about to RSI patient. Um, and he has to worry about managing the airway. If I can't start an IV and I can't manage to push those pressors or do epi infusions or nor epi infusions, um, that's just a lack of team effort on my part. So we try to run our RSIs like as a team where everybody knows their job to the best of their ability. Yeah. I think that on the communication part, it's like it might sound simple to say it or you, th- you know, assume other people are already thinking everything, speaking everything out loud into existence. I mean, it just keeps everybody on the same page, you know, keeps it moving along nicely. Yep. So on this slide, it's basically just showing that increasing your heart rate, if you're anxious, you haven't been practicing, um, it's, you know, maybe a pediatric, something like that, that you don't run very often, your heart rate can increase. So every, you know, the higher your heart rate goes, the less skills, um, you know, fine motor skills you lose and the higher it goes, just worse it gets. And then try to find something that can calm you down. I mean, practicing obviously, but sometimes no matter how much you practice, you might still get a little anxious on that call. So, um, doing this box breathing that can help um basically whatever you have to do yeah so this box i do that box breathing every time i pick up and just go yeah i do too um and it really helps to calm your heart rate down so you can critically think about the call um i've done this numerous times you know i'm not above it uh but basically you know just to explain it if nobody's ever seen it you breathe in for four seconds you hold that for four seconds and then you breathe out for four seconds and hold that for four seconds and you can do this as many times as you can to calm your heart rate back down so you can critically think through that situation so we preach this all the time it definitely works so and uh, another way to calm yourself down is use your resources i mean we have smartphones and ipads and all this other stuff that um we can use all that stuff just make our lives a whole lot easier you can look up your protocols know how to access all your information quickly um, we use the hand heavy app here. Um, you can put their age in cause you're usually getting an age on the way to a call. Mm-hmm. So you can go in there and find meds, different equipment sizes. Mm-hmm. Um, you can even find it in milliliters. So, yeah. I mean, just using all that stuff and then there's drip calculators, use everything you can just to make it easier. Yeah. The next part of y'all's class. Yeah. You talk about making the decision, like right. when to make the decision. Wheeler, right. you and I were actually on a call. I don't know, Lane, if he's told you about this yet, but we were on a call just the other day. We were working on the truck together, and we were going to RSI, this mm-hmm. patient. And we had everything out. We were we had drawn up meds. We mm-hmm. were ready to go. And we did the, the, the key part of the intubation, which is resuscitating the patient first. Mm-hmm. And then the patient woke up. Uh, we were yeah. like, we were ready to do some cool stuff and then yeah. we didn't need to. And so we had made the decision. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, making the decision is scary. We, no, we made the decision yeah. and then we ended up making the decision again, uh, yeah. the other, the other way. Yeah. And I think it was obviously it was the right decision. But. Yeah. Um, so just going over, uh, the criteria of when to make the decision, uh, is the inability to obtain and maintain a patent airway, right? Obstruction. You have, uh, functional obstruction and then pathological obstruction, uh, inability to correct deficient gas exchange. And we tell our guys, if you have an SpO2 of less than 90 and an internal greater than 50, that's respiratory failure in it by itself. Um, not saying that you need to RSI that patient, but it does need to be corrected. That's just an example. Um, inability to protect the airway. And you always hear gag reflex versus inability to swallow. We tell our guys to not ever test a gag reflex. It's just a very poor way um, to see if somebody is able to maintain their airway, right? Because you run the risk of that person gagging and then yeah. vomiting and then aspirating, right? You're literally but if they're risking drooling, exactly right. what you're trying to prevent. Right. Yeah. Um, so we tell our guys if they're drooling or, you know, in a, you know, unable to swallow, maybe snoring respiration, stuff like that, that's a much better way to tell whether somebody is able to protect their own airway. Um, and then this is, this, is, this is the reason, or this next one is where we all live at, right? Predicted clinical de- deterioration. Yeah. Uh, you just got to be a good clinician and be proactive. Yeah, I mean, hey, yeah. so one of the things that, that I tell people 
when they're, you know, like new people coming in, young, young paramedics. And I tell myself too, when I'm on a call, if the ER is going to innovate somebody within the first five to 10 minutes of me being there with that patient, nine times out of 10, 99 times out of a hundred, I failed, you know, yeah. like predicted clinical course, you get to the hospital mm -hmm. and they're going to innovate that person. As soon as you walk in the door, you yeah. should probably be doing it in the ambulance. Yeah, yeah. I think we've moved away from that. I think maybe like five years ago, we had like, you know, a good chunk of our staff, like you know, we're right across the street or whatever. Sure. I think we've gotten a lot better where if you know it needs to be done, get it handled, do it, and then get them to the hospital. We've gotten a lot more aggressive and I think it's been good. Yeah, yeah. the be proactive, not reactive. And I, I would imagine this goes for a lot of other EMS agencies as well. Um, and where we run into issues at is it's not the RSI process, it's failing to make the decision earlier rather than later, right? It's always transporting emergent, pulling over to RSI, and then now we're doing CBR, right? Mm -hmm. When you should have done it earlier when a patient's oxygen saturations were 100%, right, and be able to predict their clinical course. Yeah, so. saying something like, well, they're maintaining their own airway, perfect. That's a great yeah. time to innovate. Yeah, them. that's yeah. a perfect time. If they're, obviously, if, they're, if they need it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so moving on to our strategies, uh, it gets a little confusing here, uh, but we have we teach three three strategies basically, right, to kind of cover the broad spectrum of emergency airway management. Okay. And so, the obviously the first one is going to be rapid sequence innovation. Um, forgive me, Doctor Northheim. You know he calls it best the best. They call it sequence innovation. I just it's very hard. You know we've taking, been calling it RSI for for years. Taking the rapid out of RSI. Yeah. yeah. And so basically, we got this definition right off the MCRIT podcast, and it's, it's the, literally the best definition of RSI that you can, you can read. Um, and so basically, rapid sequence innovation is the administration after pre oxygenation and patient optimization, which means you've addressed their oxygen, or their oxygen saturations and you've uh, corrected their hemodynamics, right? Make sure all that's good, of a potent induction agent, right? So in our case, it would be a Tomidate or ketamine followed rapidly by a paralytic, which would be rock in our case, um, without the need for positive pressure ventilation. And so we tell our guys that, yeah, we try not to uh, provide ventilations via BVM because it, ri it risks gastric insufficient. But if you have to, then you have to, right? Um, I just had very rare cases where um, even stage four COPDers that I couldn't get their SATs up above 94 with a high flow nasal cannula and yeah. a non breather or C CPAP bypass. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's our definition of RSI. I like it. And I think if you think of, he said we have three strategies. If you think of RSI as like your main go to, the next two are kind of like you're branching off to to combat issues that you could be having from that normal sequence that you do. Yeah. And so delayed sequence innovation, right? And I think this has really hit uh, the last few years, you know, with uh, delaying the sequence for pre-oxygenation. And basically, it's just when the RSI sequence is broken down to allow for pre-oxygenation, right? So uh, I like to give an example of you have a patient who is intolerant of the pre-oxygenation process, like maybe they're combative due to a TBI or maybe they're anxious secondary to hypoxia from COPD or CHF. Pulling everything off, right, pulling out IVs. Right, yeah. they're just, they're not letting you pre-oxygenate. Um, so you give them a dissociative dose of ketamine, which in our case would be one mig per kg. Um, I like to tell people you can always give less um, and then see how it works and then give more if it doesn't work, yeah. right? And so basically uh, you calm them down with the ketamine, put your pre-oxygenation, um, uh, like non-breather nasal cannula back on and allow for that pre-oxygenation process. Uh, the great thing about delayed sequence innovation is after you're done setting up for the innovation all that, you can reevaluate the patient and, you know, you can be like, okay, this patient's good to go, like they're doing a lot better, right? You can just go to the hospital. Yeah. But if you need to proceed with it, you can always proceed with RSI. I think we always want everybody to, we do want everybody to set up for RSI whenever you do, even if you think you're going to be doing DSI, just so that if there are any issues, you're already set up, you're ready to go. So one of the things, and I, I don't remember if you guys talked about it later on, but one of the one of the benefits of DSI that Weingart talks about, I believe, is um, you can you can be sure that your patient is sedated before you paralyze them. I mm -hmm. mean, like you know, yeah. you're you're doing that, you know. Yeah, you're not risking care. anesthetic awareness. Yeah, yeah which you is you know that's huge, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, we'll get into the timing of medis or medications, but like for ketamine that we use for DSI, we don't use Atomidate, but for ketamine on, in that instance. Well, if you gave half a milligram, a kilogram, you know, you 
reduce your dose a little bit and it did work pretty well, well, then maybe that's what you use, you know, depending on how long it's been, how good it worked, and just kind of go from there. Yeah. So we like to use the example just to piggyback off what Lane was saying is let's say you gave the one mig per kg to dissociate them to allow for pre-oxygenation, right? Well, if it's been five minutes um, and the patient's ready to be innovated, you could just go ahead and give the paralytic and then go on about your day, right? Finish the RSI. Um, but let's say you gave that one mig per kg and now it's been 10 minutes. Well, we know that raw, or sorry, the ketamine is off in 12 to 15 minutes. Yeah. I would go ahead and redose them with an induction dose of ketamine, followed by a paralytic, and then finish the RSI. And if they, you know, if they do turn around completely, you can abandon. Not, yeah, yeah, you can abandon. It. You can abandon it, but that might be the best time to continue with your RSI. So just be really sure that. Yeah, yeah I've, seen, that I've seen several times uh, this year. Uh, you know, you fix the hypercarbia, you fix the hypoxia, and you've got to awake A and O times four patient. Yeah, it turns them completely around. So. Yeah. Um, and okay, this is what we tell everybody for uh, our failed airway situations. So uh, it's basically called rapid sequence airway, and it's the same process as RSI, except for uh, you don't intubate, you put an eye gel down. So you're not in the patient's airway with a laryngoscope risking critical hypoxia during the innovation attempt. And so um, the way we tell everybody or what we tell everybody is despite all efforts, right? Meaning you've tried to pre-oxygenate this patient with at least a high flow nasal cannula and a nodder breather, um, or sorry, not a nodder breather, but a BVM with PEEP added, and you can't get their oxygen saturations above 94% or 94 or better, mm -hmm. right? That is a failed airway. And so we just tell people to push the drugs and then put an eye gel in place. Yeah, so our new number is from in the past, it's they have to have at least 94% or greater for us to innovate. Right. Um, not to get this confused, and I just want to explain this because uh, our guys seem a little confused about this. This doesn't, this doesn't mean you show up on scene and the patient's oxygen saturations are 60% and you put a nasal cannula and non rebreather on you can only get them up to 80. You need to exhaust all efforts of pre-oxygenation and I think your end goal would be BVM, high flow oxygen, uh, nasal cannula, high flow, and maybe a little peep added to it. Yeah. Right? So. Maybe just open a bottle up too. Just kind of get the get the yeah. the room yeah. air, yeah. the room yeah. air yeah. set yeah. up yeah. a little bit. You know. Yeah, we're all breathing it in. We're all yeah. reoxygenated. <laughs> um, so this is in red for a reason. Um, so the sedation facilitated innovation. We do not do that here. I'm not saying that this isn't useful in every. This isn't useful somewhere else. But we just don't use this here um, because. It's associated with 60% first pass success rates by just giving a sedation to innovate somebody, right? The whole reason you give a paralytic is so you can render the patient completely flaccid. You can manipulate the airway to get the ET to, or you get the innovation. Their vocal cords aren't moving while you're trying right, to innovate them. Right. Um, and so, it might be called five other names, awake innovations to kind of fall in this category. There's probably a place for them, but for here, we want to make our lives as easy as possible. Yeah. Uh, the one... What we like to tell everybody in reference to this slide is we watched a video with awake innovation and the patient I believe got two to three hundred milligrams of ketamine and it was pro sedation facilitated innovation. But they couldn't get the innovation for ten minutes and they were like, see the patient's oxygen saturations aren't dropping. But the patient was also gagging and they didn't have an E2 tube in place. Yeah, right? The patient also now has PTSD. So. Right. So So I think if you've made the decision that they need to be innovated, we want that process to be as easy as possible. Yeah. And not rapid, but you know, in a timely manner. So yeah. One one thing that I've heard uh, as a proponent of, you know, people who are for you know, pharmacologically assisted uh, sedation yeah. assisted innovation. Yeah. Well, you know, if you can't get the airway, then you, they're 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 maintained on their own. It's like, hang on a second. So you needed to take the airway, you know. Yeah. And and so you didn't do use a long acting paralytic. You just you know you just sedated them. And you tried to innovate them, and now you're just going to stop. Like they still have yeah. to have their airway managed, yeah. whether they're paralyzed yeah. or not. The airway they're... didn't magically just get better. Yeah, exactly. Right? And, so, yeah. okay, so failed airway versus crash airway, right? Um, so our failed airway um, is two failed innovation attempts or unable to maintain O2 saturations greater than 93 percent, right? You are now in a failed airway. Um, so if you have a spontaneously breathing patient who you missed twice and their oxygen saturations are not a, or 94 or greater, right? That would be an RSA situation, right? Obviously, you would um, exhaust all efforts of pre-oxygenation. 
Um, and then crash airway, right? This is what we like to tell our guys is you are forced to act like a rapidly closing airway. Um, a, burn, a burn patient. Right, a burn patient or anaphylaxis. Um, obviously, like when you're hearing Strider or especially when Strider's going away, as Lane likes to tell our guys, um, where not saying you don't want to get vital signs and you don't want to pre oxygenate but airway takes priority over all everything else, right? Um, and so what we teach our guys is it would be a double setup where somebody's going to try to innovate while somebody's cracking at the same time. Um, but you would still push meds and our guys, you know, and, and me too, like it kind of didn't make sense to me. It's like, well, why would you give a paralytic not knowing that you're going to get a tube? Mm -hmm. And uh, what's scarier? What's going to kill the patient fastest? A closed airway or a paralytic? Yeah. Right? It's going to be a closed airway. Yeah, absolutely. And I can't. I can't imagine not taking a look on every patient, especially if you kind of play it safe-ish when you have somebody else cracking at the same time. And so we tell our guys, you know, basically first one to the trachea wins, mm -hmm. you know. Um, one, these are pretty rare and it's kind of a crappy situation to be in, but um, that's kind of what we teach our guys as far as so, pressure is concerned. Just to clarify, I mean, like you're probably not cutting while somebody's manipulating the trachea with the laryngoscope. Correct. But you've got a laryngoscope, you've got it clean, mm -hmm. you're right there, you've got your 6O tube, you're yes. literally about to cut. Right, right. And they, as soon as they say yes or no, yes. you're going for it. Right, okay. so you stabilize the trachea with your non-dominant hand, you have a permanent marker, you've already marked your landmarks, you have a scalpel and dominant hand, yeah. you are ready to cut as soon as they don't get the innovation, yeah. right? And on the, you know, say you were trying to do the RSA situation, this could kind of fall in that same category because some patients aren't the you know a superglottic airway is not going to be a definitive airway for a burn patient yeah, and a flaky yeah. patient like you might not be able to get their oxygen saturations up high enough but that eye gel is not going to work you're going to have to yeah. yeah we can't you know predict every single call go over every single call sure. but most of these all these yeah. things that we just cover all these strategies can get you about 99.9 yeah. percent yeah, yeah it's that it's that one percent that really that gets you yeah <laughs> MacGyver. Yeah. In one of the other episodes that I did with Ash and Art, uh, we went over briefly having to RSI somebody who was critically unstable mm -hmm. and how we just, the fact that we took our time and, you know, resuscitated first probably kept the guy from coding. So you guys talk about patient optimization. So yeah. go into that a little bit. You know, we have to fix hypoxia and we have to fix hypotension, right? So you have to resuscitate before you innovate. Um, you can't rush in missteps. This is probably why Dr. Northeim, our medical director, took rapid out of you know RSI, yep. right? Because people were rushing, and you look at this guy right here. They're skipping everything, and they're pushing drugs, and they're innovating while looks somebody's like, hypotensive or they're hypoxic. Looks like he's winning, but I mean... <laughs> yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong, dude. I, you know. I mean, it's probably, you know, it can be easy to get excited on a call, and you're like, hey, I know they need to be RSI, and you're like, okay, I'm drawing up my meds gonna push them get the innovation yeah you need to step back kind of look at everything make yep. sure everything's good to go right and go from there this is why ems gets scrutinized because we push meds and we go straight to innovation yep. right and the patient ends up dying right and it's like okay should we even be doing this right? we, so, we like to do the cool stuff and right like, yeah i mean i i like to call it out before I actually get to the med pushing part. I, I like to include everybody in right. the back of the ambulance. Like, Hey guys, yeah. we have, you know, pulse ox is this blood pressure is this. We've got this, this, and this equipment. Yeah. Sounds does like any, you took our airway course. Yeah, it does. Yeah. It does. Uh, you know, does anybody have anything else, you know, any, any other ideas? Oh yeah, no. And there's obviously some like situations where you need to be quick on your scene times, but I'm not, you know, skipping steps, you know, pre-oxygenation could take 10, 15 minutes. And then right. managing their blood pressure could take 30 minutes, you know, to get a good blood pressure to be able to push your meds and innovate them. So, yeah. you know, sometimes it you could be on scene an hour before yep. you end up parse on them. Yep. So hypoxia during emergency airway management is a feared complication and is associated with basically a two times increased odds of peri innovation cardiac arrest, right? That doesn't scare you. I don't know what, what does. Um, so you don't innovate when somebody's hypoxic. All right, so the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve, it's a mouthful, and there's a lot to it, but the main things we try to get across to our guys is that this is why we do not um, innovate somebody with low oxygen saturations. So 
On the left side of the screen, it's SpO2 and how it correlates with the PaO2. So we monitor SpO2 and uh, PaO2 is basically just the oxygen in arterial blood. Um, so like we said, we don't want to intubate somebody that's less than 94%, but this graph, it's more of like a S-shaped, sigmoid shape. It's not straight down, it's not linear. So a drop from 100 to 90% doesn't drop at the same rate as it does from like 90 to 80%. Um, that's because the farther it goes down that graph, um, oxygen just starts getting kicked off of the hemoglobin at a faster and faster rate. So one thing, one thing to consider is whenever you have um, them on the monitor and you're looking at the SpO2 and somebody's calling it out, they're like 98, 96, 94, it's dropping and then you have pulse ox lag. So if it's about 30 seconds that it could be delayed and that could even, they could already be in the 80s so and rapidly declining. So we wanna, you know, that's why we hit pre-oxygenating as much as we do. It looks like a roller coaster to me. It looks yeah. like you're about to like, you know, you're about to like put your hands up and yeah, like, yeah, in a bad way, like not fun. Yeah. Can you go over right and left shifts? I'm just kidding. We're not gonna do that. Um, okay, so whole day. now you do that. I want you to talk to me about two, three DPG. <laughs> um, so the safe apnea period, or AKA time to desaturation, um, it's basically. Once, in our case, once the paralytic hits, how long are they going to be, you know, not get hypoxic? So, yeah, about 94. Yeah, so um, they did this study. I think they had pre oxygenated these patients. They gave sucks, and then how long, you know, they had adequate oxygenation. So, obviously, if they're sick or obese, they're going to have shorter time to desaturations. Um, the way we can improve that is by pre oxygenating and... There's a lot of factors that can cause this to decrease if they have any kind of lung disease, um, if they're obese or pregnant, pregnant that yeah. can just decrease. It's putting pressure on and it's decreasing the lung volume. Um, so there's a lot of factors that can decrease your safe apnea time and pre oxygenating it increases it. Yeah. Um, so pre oxygenation, okay? Um, high flow oxygen be a nasal cannula and non rebreather at flush flow rates for at least three to five minutes to allow for nitrogen washout, right? So I think most of us here has, you know, know what nitrogen washout is. So basically you have about 78% nitrogen in your lungs, which is the same thing in the ambient air. You try to wash all that nitrogen out and replace it with oxygen. So you increase your safe apnea period, right? So they stay above 94% during your innovation temp as long as they can, right? Um, in addition to that position, Position your patient upright. Uh, anytime a, per, a patient's laying flat, they lose 30 to 50% of their tidal volume. So one of the first things you should be doing on a patient that you think you need to RSI or maybe going down that route is sitting them up as high as possible to get their weight off their diaphragm so they can take good tidal volume breaths in addition to high flow nasal cannula and non rebreather um, for pre -oxygenation. I think that's um, I think that's made a big difference. I mean, I, I don't think it was very long ago where it seemed like every time I saw somebody or I intubated somebody, you know, clear the stuff off the head of the stretcher and just drop it down all the way yeah. flat, and then you're you're intubating. And now yeah. I don't see anybody do that. It's, yeah. it's system wide. Yeah. We're, we're I think we're really good about positioning yeah. now. And I'm gonna jump ahead to here and Lane's probably gonna get mad, but. Um, even when you innovate, they should be 30 degrees and you should leave them in that position all the way to the hospital. Yeah. If the hospital wants to lay in flat, then that's that's their game. But uh, we want to be successful. We're in the back of a truck. Like, it's not easy, right? Yeah. So we can try to make everything as easy as possible for us. Um, and then also, you know, if your patient's not responding to a nasal cannula and non breather, maybe you need to add non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. Right. BVM with PEEP, like you right. were talking maybe about. Maybe yeah. BVM with PEEP, right? Um, on the uh, three to five minutes, that's for even if they're already 100% before you slap oxygen yes. on them. Right. Um, and if you walk into a house and you know that they might be RSI or they're having difficulty breathing, start pre oxygenating immediately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's not just once you get to the truck and preparing. Yeah. I've always jokingly told everybody like the nasal cannula should be turned up so far that it looks like a king cobra on somebody's yeah. face, yeah. right? Um, and I was always joking, but I was dead serious about it, right? Yeah. Turn it up as high, as high as it'll go. Um, and we're going to go over what flush rates are. Got to tape it down. You know right. what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the way we do our pre oxygenations is it's always a high flow nasal cannula in conjunction with another device, whether that's nasal cannula non rebreather maybe nasal cannula CPAP BiPAP, nasal cannula BVM, 
right? Um, and it's going to serve two purposes, and we're going to explain what that is later. So nasal cannula at 15 yeah. liters per minute is you get like 70% or 40% FiO2. Yeah. If it's an honor breather at 15 liters per minute, you're only getting like 70% FiO2. So turning it up, you know, it takes like two or three spins on our regulators to, um, to get up to 15 liters per minute. You, it has another two or three turns in it. So yeah. turning it all the way up, like it said in the last two slides, you can get near 100% on both of those. So what you're saying is once the bubble is at the top of that little chamber, yeah. it's got more room. Up. It just yeah. doesn't look like yeah. it. So it says 40 to 60 liters per For the per people minute. watching or listening, um, for the glass flow meters that are, on the, that are on our slideshow, if you look down at the very bottom, it'll say 40 to 60 liters per minute, right? So it goes way above the 15 liters per minute that that little ball goes up to, right? And that's called flush flow rates. Like Liam was saying, turn that dial till it goes all the way up till it stops. I'm not saying I learned that right. today. Yeah. But I learned it more recently than I'd like to say. <laughs> yeah. And so, like Lane was saying, if you have a nasal cannula at 15 liters and you're getting 40% FiO2 versus you turn it all the way up and you're getting near 100% FiO2, right, that's going to be way better and it's going to increase that safe apnea period for your innovation attempt. And I think with um, some of your patients, like, you know, you can get away with doing 15 and 15, but if you're trying to make everything simple and yeah. do it the same way every time, yeah. Cranking it up so that whenever you do have that patient that's yep. you know very hypoxic, it was hard to get them up, that you don't miss that step. Does this go back to treating every, every airway like it's difficult? Uh, it sounds like it does. I think it does. I may be stealing El Thunder from later on, but I think it's worth clarifying that when you're talking about nasal cannula, you're talking about a regular nasal cannula. Yes. Uh, uh, the uh, entitled cannulas that we have that come that, that match up with our life pack. 15s yes so not, not working yeah you can uh, get a max of Jeff is being a little passive here because a couple years ago he taught us uh, I believe it was about four years ago he taught us that a entitled nasal cannula um, no matter how high you have the flow meter turned up to only delivers six liters per minute right because oxygen isn't coming out of the prongs it's coming out of little fistrations around the nose piece which right? a partner of mine at a previous place of employment yeah. showed me and I absolutely she blew my mind I yeah. was like okay yeah because I've been pre-oxygen with entitled nasal cannula for years I called her a liar yeah. I was like I was like that is absolutely not true you're and then she got a she got a flush and pushed it through that entitled thing and I was like Oh my gosh. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. So if you are going to get your entitled reading, which is very important, um, but you are going to pre oxygenate, Lane teaches everybody to double stack. Yeah. So if you have a nasal cannula or an entitled nasal cannula, put it on first and then stack the regular nasal cannula on top of it or vice versa, whichever you want to do. It seems like a lot. Um, but remember, you know, you're the success in RSI is in the details. And yeah. these are very small details that you have to do. And we want those trends on the end title. So we do want to get a reading, but. If you end up putting going to CPAP, BiPAP, or BBM, you may need to take that entitle one off just to make sure you're getting a good seal. Yeah, yeah. So just to clarify with our listeners, it's always, um, or what we use, it's always a nasal cannula flush flow rates in addition to another device. So yeah. not a breather turned all the way up, uh, CPAP, BiPAP, or BBM. So yeah, we have the CPAP, bi-level, BiPAP, flow safe. Too. Flow safe. So they're auction powered. Yeah. Um, biggest thing is coaching your patient through it, uh, getting a good seal and continuously checking that seal. Cause yeah. if you're not getting, you know, at least five on there, Sorry, it's a pressure. seal. Yeah. So the apneic BVM CPAP, uh, North time went over this first time I ever heard it, but it was pretty cool. And actually George Kovacs has a video on it on YouTube. If anybody wants to go out there and look it up, but basically, it's a way to give your patient a little extra PEEP and oxygenation or a little bit of you know, CPAP with the BVM without providing ventilations. So the process is you stick a nasal cannula on the patient, turn it all the way up, take a BVM, put a PEEP valve on it, hook it up to oxygen, turn it all the way up, and hold the mask to the patient's face, do a good jaw thrust, and whatever you have your PEEP set at is what CPAP you're delivering to that patient. So if you have your PEEP set at five, if you hold, have a good mask seal, it, you'll be getting a CPAP of five without risking gastric insufflation with a ventilation, yeah. right? So the way Lane likes to describe it is, let's say you had trouble getting somebody up above 94, right? And you don't want to give them ventilations, but you also don't want them to, de to desat on you. Um, you push your meds, put that on, just like I said, yeah. and then hold that mask real tight to them, and that just helps recruit alveoli and helps oxygenate and all that good stuff. So, so. using the BiPAP as, or excuse me, using the BVM as CPAP, and yeah. then if you need it, 
yeah, yeah. that way you're not having to get a different device. Yeah. Um, I tell, we tell all of our guys, if you're not doing a jaw thrust maneuver with a BVM, right, you're not giving adequate ventilations because when you do a jaw thrust maneuver, it lifts the trach or sorry, the epiglottis right off of the glottic opening. So your ventilations are going down the trachea versus going into the esophagus. Mm -hmm. I think we've you know heard a few times about people putting the BiPAP on or asking if they could put the BiPAP mask on and then hooking up BVM to that. If you're not doing a mask seal, you know, doing the jaw thrust with it, then it's not, it can close that airway just like that yeah. video showed. Okay, so the bag, bag valve mask, we recently switched to these. Uh, these are adult PD non-rebreathers that give a max out of volume of 500 mils. It's so also got a pop-off valve. We don't need 1,500 mils? No, no, no. we're going to go over that. That's man. But you, I kind of miss the old bags just because it really feels like you're doing something yeah. when you squeeze it with both okay. hands, right? You're getting somewhere. Um, you just give them 60 yeah. breaths a minute with 1,500 yeah. mils. It's fine. <laughs> um, what we like to tell our guys with this BVM is uh, not to get too anxious when you got to bag somebody you know, maybe it's in between innovation attempts or maybe it's for pre Um, We like to tell them that no matter how many times you squeeze that bag, it doesn't increase oxygen saturations. There's only two things that increase oxygen saturations. That's the concentration of oxygen that's coming through your tank, which is 100%, yeah. and PEEP. Yep. Right? There's only two things. So if you squeeze that bag 60 times a minute, that does nothing for your patient. Um, and also it risks gastric insufficient. So if you're going to provide ventilations via BVM, Nice slow breaths every five seconds over one second, right? Um, don't squeeze it forcefully because it doesn't take much pressure to open up the esophagus and for a ventilation to go straight into the esophagus. So, um, was it 20 centimeters of water? Yeah, it's 20 yeah. centimeters of water, and you know, it's not instant. Like, like Lane was saying earlier on the pulse ox, like it's lagged, so it might take you a minute or two, maybe three minutes, to start seeing an improvement in your oxygen saturations. But as long as you're doing two thumbs down technique with two person, right? Connected to high flow, maybe add a little peep to it. You got a good mass seal, just relax. You're, they're gonna come up, right? They're gonna come up. Yeah. I think we like telling people, you know, princess breaths on giving that ventilation so that yeah. they don't just forcefully get it in there and, you know, rapidly give the breath, so. Yeah. All right, guys, that was part one. Come back for part two. This has been an episode of the PCHD EMS podcast. Thank you for joining us.